Welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board meeting on Tuesday, September 12th, 2017. If you'd please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number one on the agenda. Are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Seeing none. Item number two, approval of school board minutes. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the school board minutes as represented in our packet. A second? Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. <laughs> Item number three, comments by student representatives. I would like to welcome Allie Ingalls and Emily Healy. <laughs> you don't have to, you can just sit right there. Um, hi, my name is Emily Healy. I'm a senior at Cape Elizabeth High School this year. And I'm Allison Ingalls, and I'm going to be, or I am a junior at Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, Okay, so first we'd just like to give an update about our sports teams. Um, the Cape Elizabeth girls soccer team is 3-1 and one, uh, so far this season, and last night we had a huge win against York. Um, we beat them 5-1, to one, which was really exciting. Um, and football is 2-0. and oh. They have an away game this weekend. Um, golf is 4-0. and oh. Boys soccer is 1-1, one and, one, and they play Wells tonight at 7. Um, Cape Elizabeth girls volleyball is 4-0 and they have an away game at Biddeford today. Um, Biddeford is a really big rival for them so that's really exciting. Um, and cross country had a meet last weekend and they placed second I believe um, and they have another meet this Saturday. Um, so we have school-wide book groups this Thursday um, so we'll be meeting in those. Um, and then the Seeds of Peace domestic program opened the application process to non-partner schools this year. Um, and I was actually selected and attended um, as Cape Elizabeth's oh. first representative. So I'm hoping to work with my peers and the administration to incorporate Seeds of Peace philosophies into the Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, and then Mr. Carpenter and Mr. Cohan worked really hard this year to revamp um, the Freshman program which served as a really good entry for the freshmen um, sort of into the high school. Um, and so we had a lot of support from the upperclassmen that came in early on the first day of school um, and volunteered and were paired with um, one or two freshmen. Um, and they sort of just helped them, showed them around, showed them their lockers, um, and introduced them to the school. And now we'll be acting as just mentors um, throughout the year. Um, so the first day was a little bit unorganized, but we got it figured out, um, just working out the kinks, basically. Um, and so yeah, I think it was a very successful program so far. And um, so Mr. Jones, the achievement, who runs the Achievement Center um, in the high school, is working on improving the Achievement Center to ensure that students are where they're supposed to be if they're signed out to the AC. Because often, some students will sign out to the Achievement Center in their study hall and then leave the school or go somewhere where they're not supposed to be. And so Mr. Jones is just working really hard to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore. Um, further, study halls are also doing the same thing, um, ensuring that students who don't have freeze are on task instead of roaming the halls. So if um, a student signs out to the cafeteria, they're only allowed to be there for 10 or so minutes or less, and then they have to come right back to their study hall if they don't have junior or senior freeze. Um, the September 21st, we'll be hosting the Activities Fair, um, which is an opportunity for mostly up underclassmen um, to walk around and um, experience what the clubs are at Cape Elizabeth High School. And I think it's a, a very special time because I think clubs play a really big role um, at the high school. And so they just are given the opportunity to look around, meet some of the people, um, participate, and just sort of get a, get a feel um, for what the upcoming year will be like. And we definitely really encourage 
freshmen especially to get involved in these clubs because it's one of the best ways um, to meet upperclassmen and to sort of get themselves into the school, immerse themselves in the school. Um, and then, so one sort of frustration among the students right now is the iPads. Um, and just because that's been a big change this year. Um, so this year is the first year that iPads are going to be required in all classes. Um, and in the past, some students have had their personal either laptops or other devices um, that they've been using in classes in place um, of the iPads. But this year, um, the, the technology department downloaded specific technologies onto this iPad, so it will be more productive. Um, so I think that although students are a little bit frustrated, um, I think it'll be a good change just because everyone has a uniform set of technologies um, that we will be able to use moving forward. And the last thing that Alice and I um, would like to talk about is the habits of work grades. Um, I don't know if anyone has any specific question that they'd like to ask or if it's okay if I just if we just read what we wrote. Is that alright with everyone? Okay. Um, so we have had just I think our peers and students in general are not crazy about the habits of work grade. Um, the initial way of communicating the change to the grading system was confusing. Individual advisors and teachers said different things that ended up needing clarification for, well, further on in the future and in different classes. Um, the students, some students feel that they discourage participation in extracurriculars and seem unnecessary for students who don't need extra discipline. So just to clarify that, um, I think Allison and I have good study habits, not to brag, but we um, hand in our work on time and so we've never really been affected by um, handing in a homework grade late or not taking a test on time or handing in an essay a couple weeks late. And so to students, to high achieve high achieving students, um, the habits of work just doesn't really change anything about the way we've been going about our grading system, the way we've been going about handing in work and going about our grades. Um, but for students who do have trouble uh, handing in their work on time, we and other students also believe that habits of work will do a great job keeping them on task and making sure that they do hand in their work on time because they'll be held a lot more accountable because it does, the habits of work grades do go into affecting eligibility and whether they're not, whether or not they're able to participate in extracurriculars um, such as sports, clubs, any after school activity. Um, I think that's actually been being voted on tonight. Right? Is that? Mm -hmm. but, yeah. And then, a, a, but a downside of that is people who don't participate in extracurriculars now aren't really affected if they don't meet the habits of work requirements. So. Um, some students who don't play sports or don't participate in extracurriculars feel, have voiced their opinion that they don't find it necessary to have a passing grade and have this work specifically because their eligibility for extracurriculars won't be affected. Um, while students should have good habits of work, uh, some of our peers believe that it demonstrates the principle that if you don't do your homework, it won't neg negatively impact your grade. Um, there also isn't really a consistency with how the habits of work grades are put into the portal. Some students, some teachers in some, um, uh, what is it called, like in his, the history section of the school or the, like in certain um, departments will implement the rules differently. Um, for example, I was told by my advisor that we would be allowed to make up um, obviously to some degree, like if you get a 98, you can't make a test, try and just be like, I want to make this test of 2 and 100, but if you have a test that you'd like to make up, you're allowed to go to the teacher and ask for help and do work to show you understand the material and then make the test up. Um, but a lot of my teachers have communicated that this isn't going to be the norm in all of our classes. Um, so I don't know, obviously it's really early in the year, but it just seems that the consistency isn't there throughout every single department, and I think this has been confusing for a lot of students. I, just going off that, I definitely agree with that, and I think that if we can bring some uniformity across the um, entire staff, I think it would um, help a lot of the students just to know what the actual expectations are um, and not feel sort of wishy-washy about um, these expectations. 
And then just finally, one other comment I've heard from a lot of students is that homework grades not going into the portal to affect your grade um, is going to be detrimental because um, in some classes, credit has been given for homework um, and that has sort of been an extra credit points almost. Um, and so taking that factor away, it's in the portal, it's basically just going to be tests and quizzes. Um, so it might be a little bit more difficult. Um, but then it's confusing because we're also unsure if we are allowed to make up every test we yeah. take, every quiz we take, what are we allowed to make up. Um, that's something I don't even understand, so I'm not really sure if that'll be clarified in the future, but <coughs> that's essentially what we have. Does anyone have any questions? It will be part of our discussion when we get to that part of policy. Thank you. Awesome. I have one question in terms of, um, was there discussion about the academic piece of the eligibility along with the habits of work or is it just the habits of work piece? Um, I think that the eligibility requirement is going to be maintained for the academic piece so you'll just need to maintain a 70 or uh, a passing grade in your classes. So I guess. And I've understood the opposite that the, your eligibility is only dependent on your habits of work grade so as long as you have a passing in your habits of work class then your no, able to policy pass. includes both. Okay. Continues the academic and adds the habit of work. Okay. That's okay. confusing. We'll talk about it when we get to that. Okay, I can see why everybody, it, why there is confusion. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, definitely it's changes. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. And there are big changes, and that obviously comes with confusion as they're implemented. Right. So we appreciate you bringing this up and opening yeah. up the conversation and bringing us your perspective. It's important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Moving on to item four. Comments from the public on agenda items. At this time, anybody from the public is welcome to move to the podium. Seeing none. Moving on to item five, communications. We'd like to welcome a, uh, <clears throat> not a fist fight, but some sort of way for the principals to figure out who's going to speak to us first tonight. <laughs> We're also going to hear from the Director of Teaching and Learning, so I don't know how you all yeah, are going to... Yeah, absolutely good to hear. Oh, we're also going to hear from Jess? Mm -hmm. Just Jess. Okay, so, well. <laughs> Director of Special Services. <laughs> I guess I'm going. I just wanted to give a quick overview of how things are going, how the summer was, and all of these nice pieces that we talked about through the budget season, how they're actually coming to fruition and how the programs are coming um, into place. So I told Howard I'd be five minutes. Um, we're currently serving 157 students in the special ed department and we currently have 13 in referral, which means that they're, um, they're receiving some type of support but not um, eligible for special ed yet. Um, some of the things that we put into place that have been going since the summer are the student, student support coordinator positions. Um, they've done a lot of work over the summer preparing their response to intervention, um, making sure that basically our students were ready when they walked in the door with schedules, making sure staff had what they needed. And the feedback just in the two weeks that we've had them has been really positive about having that support um, and hearing both sides, regular ed and special ed. Um, the BCBA, the Board Certified Behavior Analyst that now we have district-wide, um, will start out as a special ed support just because that's where the priority is. Um, but it's been presented that that person's going to be available for regular teachers in helping with classroom management and that nice responsive classroom system that we put in. Those are going to go hand in hand. So that's another thing we're excited about. Um, something that we changed completely this year is that all IEP scheduling is done ahead of time and we're hoping that by doing this parents will be able to schedule ahead of time, teachers will be able to schedule ahead of time, we can plan for when subs are needed. Um, it just makes less of a crazy mess kind of the day of. So um, all of the meetings have been scheduled September through December and then over winter break just tell that the office manager is going to schedule the rest of them for the year and hopefully that is a better use of her time as well to be able to take over more responsibilities. We have um, 
started the refresher trainings for our physical and verbal de-escalation training that we do district-wide. So we have, with people that left, we have about 40, and um, we'll have 20 more by the end of November, and everybody's going to be on the same cycle. So hopefully, we're not taking school time to do this. We're going to be doing it over the summer once we get everyone on the same cycle. That's the intention. Um, and then this is the first time that we've opened the training completely to regular ed staff. So I actually have quite a bit of um, regular ed teachers that were interested in the verbal de-escalation and the physical part. Um, and that being said, I don't have the number, but using the de-escalation um, that has been really emphasized throughout the three buildings, our use of restraint has gone down exponentially. We were in the 30s the year before, and I think we had three or four last year. So that's huge. People are really using those verbal skills, which is what we want. We want kids to be in the classroom. Um, we've also, um, I had a six different school district wide professional development opportunity and because we had so many people, um, they gave us a really great rate. So we have 20 Cape Elizabeth staff members um, from the special ed department going to the Sarah Ward executive functioning training on October 30th and she is one of the best in that area. So hopefully once we get these individuals uh, trained, some of that half day professional development time can be used to train more people and really get some of her ideas off the ground. Um, We've started the Parent Advisory Committee this year. However, we're doing bi-monthly with school staff. I believe they're doing the opposite months just themselves as a parent group, which is great. Um, and we're going to be, the first meeting is in October. It's on the 3rd. And it's going to be the introduction of all new special ed staff and administrators. And everyone's welcome to attend. And then we have some really good training for the ed techs already taken place. And then we've started to organize those trainings to continue throughout the year for them. Um, Jesse Graham, who we had cover maternity leave as a speech and language pathologist, does a really good job taking direct service and, and letting everyone know how it generalizes, what it looks like in best practice. And she spent um, a half a day during our professional development days teaching the ed tech some of that material. And then also we had our BCBA doing a lot of the behavior support for our ed techs too. They're our first line of support for the kids, so it's important that they have the tools that they need. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for working that out, Mr. Shedd. <laughs> <laughs> but these guys sit back. I saw some these nice verbal, de verbal de escalation over there. That was nice. They want their senior member to. <laughs> so I want to just talk about. Uh, one aspect of proficiency-based education, the habits of work and eligibility that um, Allie and Emily were talking about earlier are one aspect of a proposal that's before the board tonight. So I'm not going to get into the details. What I wanted to talk about just for a minute is what the communication has been um, around proficiency-based education. So I'll start by saying that across the state, um, schools, all high schools in the state are moving to proficiency-based diplomas and proficiency-based education beginning with this year's ninth grade class. Um, and really, the idea behind proficiency-based education is about as simple as it gets, which is the idea that the grade that a student gets in class should reflect the extent to which the student has met the learning goals of the class. Um, that's what proficiency-based education is about. It sounds commonsensical, but it's not always ever really been the practice because typically teachers have, for very good reason, um, blended into the aspect of grades that represents academic accomplishment of the goals of the class. They've blended in things like um, a class participation or um, extra credit assignments, or even though we didn't call it at that time, this, habits of work, and whether work was done on time or not done on time, and that sort of thing. And different teachers had different approaches to that. Um, so, so what we decided to do um, is to take some incremental steps towards, um, towards proficiency-based education. Um, and at a school board workshop soon, I think, I'm not sure it's been scheduled yet, we'll be talking with the board and having a conversation with the board about the details of the approach. So today I just want to talk about communication. So let me talk about teachers first, which and the communication around this and the planning around this really started um, early last fall, I would say. Um, a proficiency-based education committee was formed. Most of the members of it were teachers. Um, the principal of the middle school and the high school are also part of it. Kathy Stankard organized it as the director of teaching and learning. 
Um, and I would say I would characterize the work of the committee as the committee engaged in some very robust debate about possible different models for approaching PBE. Um, but it was always respectful, and in the end, um, one particular model was selected, which is where we're going. I would say, I will say that that the differences between the models are a little bit abstract, and they have to do with some subtleties about how teachers handle grade books. Um, they weren't any particular philosophical disagreements in any way. Um, and under each of the models that we talked about, the, the shifts were going to be, and are planned to be, quite incremental in steps. Um, and grounded in traditional practices that people will recognize very easily. Um, so this past summer, after sort of a model was adopted, this past summer, um, Kathy and I worked with a group of teachers to really dig into, okay, if this is the overall model we're going to use, what's it look like in terms of the way teachers manage their grade books, handle grades, um, and that sort of thing, which is, I won't bore the board with details about that, but it's near and dear to teachers' hearts. Um, and the mantra that we operated under was to try to adopt a system that would be simple, manageable, and educationally valuable. Um, and I believe that we, I believe that we've done that. Um, but it's, but the, it can feel very daunting in terms of the magnitude of the changes, nevertheless. And some parts of it are, uh, particularly in the things that teachers are doing behind the scenes. Um, so the first day back uh, for teachers, the Monday of that week before students came to school, the entire day was devoted to professional um, proficiency-based education um, and the details about the grade book. There was a guide, many-page guide that the advisory committee came up with uh, this summer. Um, and so teachers had the opportunity to practice the skills and discuss things and, and that sort of thing. Um, in, in terms of communication with parents and families, that really began with a letter in early August to all families and students. Um, to introduce them to the ideas of proficiency-based education um, and the changes it made and really focusing on a couple of messages. One is that the changes we were making were grounded in traditional recognizable practices. There are a lot of school districts who have gone way, way far into proficiency-based education as step one and we are not there. Um, and the second thing is to emphasize that really in terms of what students and parents ex will experience, it's really a change in the direction of providing more details about how students are doing, specifically against targets, um, academic learning targets embedded within courses. Um, so that was a letter to, I'm sorry, in early August was a letter to ninth grade families, because they're the ones, the families of ninth graders, ninth graders, the ones that are directly affected by the <coughs> academic graduation changes. And then in mid-August, a, a letter was sent to all students and parents um, introducing, to, introducing folks to aspects of the changes that affect all students. And the one that understandably has gotten the most attention is what Emily and Allie were talking about, which is habits of work and eligibility. There are some other things too, but those are the major things. On the first evening of school, um, Tuesday evening after Labor Day, we held a ninth grade parent orientation where a lot of the changes were highlighted. Um, Friday and Monday, this past Friday and Monday, and this again is what Allie and Emily were talking about, we asked advisors um, to introduce students. And there's always risks of that. There's always pluses and minuses in terms of how you spread information um, about new initiatives to people. Um, and we opted to allow advisors to translate the new system with a, a very detailed sort of handout that went to all students, which I left back at my chair. I, was, I have a copy I'll give to all board members. Um, and sort of a, a series of some lesson plans, essentially, for teachers to share it. But inevitably, when you do that, there are differences, and, and so I'm not surprised that that happened. Um, and so there is some cleanup, some misconceptions that we have to clean up, and I think we will do that. Sort of the next step in terms of unfolding, well, the next step in terms of unfolding to parents in particular are two forums that we have scheduled, one on October 3rd at 6 o'clock p.m. for any interested parents to get more questions answered, another one on October 12th at 7 o'clock, 7.30 in the morning, also for parents, and I know that between now and then we will start to have further discussions with students. I have to figure out the best way to do that. I'm thinking by grade level probably. 
Um, I have sent out an email to staff based on the conversations and advisory group on Friday to say, tell me what the misunderstandings you're hearing from students so that we can begin to correct them. Um, I know the board received an email from one student the other day about a, a contained misconception that I'm glad she shared, which was that the reason for doing this in terms of habits of work and things had to do with the fact that our rankings fell a little bit in U.S. News last year. Um, and it's true that our rankings fell last year, but that, but that, I know we've talked about that last year with the school board, but that has absolutely nothing to do with habits of work or eligibility or anything. Um, but we'll continue to work. Uh, we've done a lot of communication. Uh, we have further communication specifically scheduled. Um, we definitely will do more for students. We are undergoing a process of change. Um, uh, change is hard. It requires lots of communication. The communication is critical, and we will do it. So that has been our communication plan. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I think I've met some of you. I'm Troy Eastman. I'm the principal at the middle school. And uh, it's been a whirlwind couple of weeks, actually. <laughs> so in the morning, I wake up looking at the mountains, and I get out of my car when I get here, and I'm smelling the ocean. So it's wonderful. I live in Norway. It's about a 60-minute drive um, in the morning. It seems like a little longer in the afternoon. I don't know if I'm tired or if traffic's in my way. But so something's going on there. Uh, the things, Cape Elizabeth is a unique place I've come to learn in two short weeks. Um, and it's, a passion, and it's a group of people that are very passionate for their kids and, want, and have high expectations. So who in their right mind would not want to work in that place, right? And I feel fortunate to, to get to do that. To, just this morning, I got to step into a meeting with a whole, a, a large group of a parent organization. And in my past, I've never had that. In middle school, they usually, the kids are telling the parents, stay away, don't, you know, don't come see, don't come to school. Um, and it's kind of energizing to see that that's, actually not the case, and it's very supportive. So I've enjoyed that. Um, one of the biggest challenges, I think, for me is, is coming in and trying to learn a little bit of the history and how things are done and, and, and what's valued in a community. And the schedule has been a struggle at the middle school. If any of you have children in the middle school, you're probably aware of that. And there's a six-day rotation, and there's every other day, and before, like, I have copies on my desk, and that's how I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, but it's because there's a lot of people want to offer a lot of things to our, to your kids and not limit them. And when you do that, you have to have a schedule that creates a lot of opportunities within it. And uh, I think from last year's schedule to this year, it's been an effort to provide more availability to kids for a range of things from RTI ability to, to some special education services to GT. There's a, there's a lot of people trying to get at kids throughout a day in the middle school. And the schedule has to provide that flexibility. And right now, we're kind of working our way through what was someone, what was best thoughts and best attempts for that. So I think we're ironing that out. Thankfully, we have a lot of really wonderful people working at the middle school that are helping me, th helping me through that. Um, I've kind of set a goal that I'll be in every classroom every day, and that's lofty. And I think probably that's something that every administrator says they will do. Um, I have made it pretty much up until today doing that really well. but. The, the goal is for my, either myself or my assistant principal to hit every room every day. And until kids know that we're in those rooms and, and teachers feel that as support, not somebody checking in on them, uh, I think that there's a natural sense of, oh, who are you? Uh, but now I can walk in. I'm not a distraction. I was the first couple days. But it's kind of become old habit. And it's really an, it's an, it's uplifting, I think, to see that. And now I've asked the teachers, when I come in, can you please call the kids by names? because I'm trying to figure them out. I know we have an Atticus, and we have, but they change their clothes every day, and I can't ever keep up with who they are. So, so that being said, it's, it's been a wonderful, well, it's true, they, every day they just change. Um, when, before I left here, quick story, I was leaving, and I heard a ball dribbling in the gym, and I just got beat by a six-year-old, ah, six year, sixth grader, um, in a game of horse. So I'm like, oh. <laughs> And I left with a bad back. So, so that's how that all works. But it's been an awesome start to the year. There's so many supports for our kids. And it's really about making sure we use, maximize all those supports um, in a way that I think that, that every kid should be supported with what we have. Um, the staff's been wonderful. 
and I, I'm happy to be here. So I look forward to meeting you and talking to you. Um, oh, the wear green, bring green. That was thought of by Mrs. One of Jason's teachers at Pond Cove, um, and it's an attempt to support the hurricane relief. And so Jason and I at Pond Cove teamed up to do the same thing on the same day, except I think Jason tricked me because his picture day is on Monday and mine was on Friday. So <laughs> unless you wanted every Cape Elizabeth Middle School kid to be wearing green for their pictures, that was going to be a problem. So um, I let that thing go out, and then today I followed up with another email home. Just kidding. We're actually doing it Monday so that you can dress how how you would like to dress your kid for picture day. Um, so the, the thought behind that is, you know, dress in green, show support, be, be, be one, and bring in whatever you can if you can, and we'll collect it and send it. So um, thank you. It's been good, and I look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Trey. Thank you. Good evening. And Troy, I knew about that picture day conflict the whole time. I was just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Set it up. <laughs> it That's been, awesome. Yeah. Well, good evening. It's so nice to, to see, meet all of you and see some of you again. Um, it has been an incredible start, um, you know, right from, from the interview process to the community forums and the staff forums, and then it's, it's really just kind of snowballed to me and, and really kind of gotten better and better in terms of like meeting outstanding teachers and parents and students and, and colleagues. Um, so much support. Um, it, it's made the transition really easy, especially coming in late August. Um, you can imagine that there's a potential for a lot of challenges, but um, I felt like I've been in good hands, you know, being supported by, by the community. Um, and so it, I think there's a lot of energy at Pond Cove right now. I really do. And, and our goal is to really um, not have that be a honeymoon period, but have that be the way, the way that we do business. Um, and so and that's, that's challenging, but um, I'm really optimistic. I'm thinking that um, it's going to be an exceptional year at Pond Cove. Um, we have a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, the, the, the fundraiser, um, working with Troy in, in his building, kind of um, bringing us together, I think is, is a high point for a lot of people, have, a lot of staff have come to me and commented about that, um, that that feels really good to them. Um, so we're excited and, and regardless whether it's on exactly the same day, I don't think that makes a difference even though we had to make that adjustment. I think it's just as special. Um, so some of the things that we're excited about um, that I hear a lot of buzz around, the, the PD Wednesdays, I think. We're really grateful for that. Um, and I was so pleasantly surprised to come into the position in August and see, how, see the thoughtful planning that had already taken place. And I'm excited to now be a part of that and contribute. Um, but so we have, uh, on Wednesday the 20th is our first one and we have K through two teachers uh, staff working with our literacy consultant Tracy Warren on um, writing workshop um, instruction. Uh, we have our three through uh, four teachers um, working with Thomas um, Chaltry, our tech integrator. He's going to be doing uh, a wonderful session on Apple Classroom with those folks in addition to the other allied arts teachers. So we've got um, some expertise contracted in, and we've got some expertise from within providing. Um, it's just really, I think, the perfect balance there. Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, we are, uh, there's a lot of energy around our uh, total of now five um, RTI educational technicians, and we're really pleased with how that's, how that's rolling out. Um, they've been um, in classrooms, building relationships with teachers and students, at the same time being pulled out, training for uh, administering assessments and for certain um, types of instruction. And they're going to, um, we have a RTI block schedule, and they're actually going to be providing direct service for about four hours a day, which is really good when you think about the day, in elementary school day, how much instructional time there is with recess and lunch. Of course, those times are also instructional, but we're pretty pleased with that, to have 
that amount of support for that many hours a day, um, we think it's going to be pretty powerful. So, um, so those are some of the things that we're excited about. So one thing that we're struggling with a little bit, and we're working together, is um, um, providing adequate coverage at some of our duties. We're looking at that, and I know that um, you were all included on an email from Howard um, that we've been discussing that as well, and we're still kind of thinking. Um, we're going to be use, utilizing uh, parent volunteers as well. We're starting a program for that. Um, but there are still a few concerns around um, the uh, available staff we have for some of that coverage uh, because those are actually instructional times and those are times when we're teaching. So the volunteers enhance that, but we need a, a good strong core of, of staff to, um, to teach those expectations. So that's something that we're thinking about right now, and I just wanted to make sure that you were all aware that we're struggling with that a little bit. Um, but I think that's all I have tonight. It's been wonderful, wonderful six days. So. <laughs> 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 Am I telling the truth, Kathy? <laughs> we are having fun, though, really. It's excellent. Yeah. Um, I was just going to mention, Jason, thanks for um, talking about your first early release Wednesday the 20th when we adopted that calendar last year it wasn't without dissent and we said that we'd love to hear and so this is an address just to you but also to Troy and Jeff that we're really going to be looking for feedback in a few months about the worthiness of that time. Some teachers not so much in your building worried about taking away time from instruction others completely valued the ability to have some really good learning time together. So really good notes about use of those days, whether or not those concerns diminished, whether the positives outweigh the negatives, or is it switched, will be important for us to hear in a few months. Great. Okay. Great. Thank yes. You. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody else have? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome. Any other administrators? <laughs> Moving on to the superintendent's report. Well, good evening. I, I believe I sent you a note uh, that we received earlier, and uh, uh, actually in August, a, a letter of resignation from Pam Garish. Pam. Uh, was one of the head people at the high school cafeteria. She had been there for at least five years, did a great job, and um, has decided to go into, uh, to, to just move ahead with her family's business in, in catering. So we wish her um, great success with that and certainly thank her for her time with us. Um, when, when Pam stepped down, the, our, our food service director, uh, Peter Esposito, thought this might be a time to rethink, to, to, to rethink the design of support in both kitchens. Again, we have the one for Pond Cove and the middle school and the other at the high school. And, and he felt that it, it might be wise to have an assistant food services director. Um, he has outlined a draft job description that's in your packet tonight. And um, he's gone over the finances with Kathy uh, Mesmer. And um, he's had a meeting with the total staff of both kitchens. Um, I, I confirmed with him and I, on, in an email to be sure I've got this right, that there is support for this shift, provided there is additional um, staffing part-time at, at the high school during the busy lunch hours. And he got back to me and I saying, that's absolutely right, that's what he plans to do, and it's uh, a net savings financially, which is good because that program has been running into, in, into the red uh, for several years now. And this isn't gonna be the, the uh, solution to all that, but it, it, it helps reduce expense. Um, so, uh, you'll hear more about that when we get, if you want to, tonight, we get to it as an action item. But once you be aware that that's where we are with that um, development. Um, actually, today we had a training that was put on by the 
MMA, the Maine Municipal Association. It was, it was actually arranged by, uh, by Kathy Mesmer, Catherine Mesmer, um, for all of our administration and directors around workers' comp and just helping us be aware of how this all works and what we can do to, um, to minimize confusion, also to minimize accidents for our employees. Um, one recommendation that came out of that was that we form a, a safety committee that perhaps would meet monthly and, and, and Catherine will be um, arranging a group to, to meet monthly just for that purpose of looking at the, the, the past month's experience, if there were accidents, what uh, can we learn from that, how can we help prevent that, how can we uh, avoid this in the future. Anyway, that's, that was a good uh, outcome for that meeting. We, we, we learned a lot. Um, I also spoke earlier today with Peggy Pacini. Um, she, you, you may remember, is the, works for the Department of Education, and she is the director of what's called the Educational Educator Effectiveness Coordinator, meaning teacher evaluation. Um, I approached her last year asking for the department's review and uh, approval of a change in the plan we use for evaluating our principals. The plan that we have, principals and I, um, and I believe other administrators, agree that it was just, it was cumbersome and it was, uh, it was confusing and that we could do better than, than what we had. Uh, no disrespect to those who designed that plan. Um, we felt that what is in place currently in Falmouth was uh, more manageable, clear, and useful to us. We submitted largely that plan to the department. Peggy felt that it was um, very likely that they would approve that for CAPE. I'll hear back from her later in this week or next week. So it may be that on your October agenda will be an action item to change the plan for, for principals, and I think that will be a, a step forward. Um, I wanted to point out to you, it's in your packets, but in terms of enrollment numbers, this um, September count is um, 1,605 students. Last June, the count was 1,617, and last September, in other words, a year uh, ago this month, we had 16,012. So it's, it's, I think it's fair to say that our enrollments are, have leveled off. Um, and uh, I actually was thinking that maybe they'd gone up, but we, while we gained a good number of students, I think I, think I heard as many as 70, we obviously must have lost around 70. But uh, I'm just pleased to see that our, our, our enrollments are, 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 are pretty constant right now, and that's, that's encouraging to me. Um, I know that's going to be a topic that we have brought up when we meet, I meet with the, um, what's it called, the Strategic Planning Committee. Susanna, do you sit on the Comprehensive, comprehensive, plan. comprehensive plan. Comprehensive Plan. And, and I heard that they want to know about our enrollments, and that's going to factor into their thinking for Cape Elizabeth. But um, for now, the, the word is it's, it, it, they're, they're they're steady, 1,600 plus. Um, I, I also wanted to say that I also am, am feeling when I go in our buildings that there's a great deal of excitement, enthusiasm. Um, I, I see that in meeting. Um, often with just informal gatherings of, of, with teachers. I ran to teacher today out for a walk. Um, people are, 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 are excited. I, I go to schools, students and parents uh, are um, alive, ex you know, energy is there, uh, good communication, a lot of respect. I, I just feel our schools are in really good shape and I hope that you know that and see that yourselves. But I, I'm very impressed by our students, by their parents, by our teachers, administrators. It's just, it's, we're, we're actually in an enviable position right now. It's nothing I take um, for granted. I'm sure you don't either. This last year, there were a number of people complaining about the condition of our buildings. Um, and, and we 
met with people in the custodial uh, and maintenance crews to talk about what could we do to support them and what could they do to maybe make some, some, some gains on the, just the general appearance and condition of our schools. And to the credit of our custodians and maintenance crew and, and, and their directors, people put in a, a lot of extra effort over the summer in our schools uh, show up. I mean, people in our schools are commenting that, my gosh, it's been a long time since I've seen our schools look quite like this, and it's appreciated, and I want you to know that it's, it's all about the people that did that work, and so congratulations and our appreciation to them. Also, the technology crew, you, uh, the young ladies mentioned um, the iPads. There was a lot of work bringing in um, all these new iPads and turning back into whatever they do with the old uh, laptops and then assigning these and getting them up and running and, um, and then for the staff, the faculty, uh, and then the training for all the staff and faculty at the end of the summer. It's just been a lot of work in our tech department and I just wanted to mention that crew too, that they just put in, it, it, was, not your every, it, was, it was not your average summer, they put in uh, a great deal of effort to make it work as well as it has so far. Um, and I, I, I don't want to leave out people that work in our office. Uh, in, in Catherine's office, we, we have um, uh, Arlene um, Wilford, who is in charge of human resources. And we had so many new employees this year and people retiring. It was just a, she had an incredibly busy summer just managing all the change in personnel. And I wanted to acknowledge Arlene, but also uh, Kathy Stankard and, and Jessica Clark, who have got their own full-time jobs and stepped in and did a lot of extra work in each of our um, elementary and middle schools over the summer with personnel to kind of, kind of keep things moving when we were kind of at, at, at a, uh, a low point there in terms of just efficient numbers of staff. So I want to acknowledge all of everyone's good, uh, work and, and thank them all uh, sincerely. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Howard. Yeah. Uh, could I just say thank you to you too, Howard? I imagine it wasn't the summer you envisioned you were going to have right <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. No rest for the weary. <laughs> Moving on to item 6B, may I have a motion, please? I move that we authorize to 6A. What? Um, was there, did I skip 6 Yes, I did. Yeah. I had so much re written on there, I skipped it. Thank you, Joe. 6A. We're at 6A, not 6B. <laughs> I move that we um, authorize the lease purchase um, agreement in the amount of $90,596 for um, one more school bus. Second. Discussion? Does, uh, is someone here that can just bring us up to speed on um, the, the new? Catherine's here, this is about approving a, a loan with a bank. Okay. The, the money's in the budget, but Catherine, go ahead. Good evening. So, um, as Howard mentioned, this is a uh, lease purchase for a bus. It's uh, for three years, um, and it is in the budget for the three-year cost. And the 90596 is actually a little less than what we budgeted, so we have a little leeway there. And I, as you saw in the paperwork, I did, I sent it out to five different banks and four responded. And uh, I went with the company that we went with, um, Androscoggin Bank, because their interest rate may have been a little higher, but they don't require, because the bus costs less than 100000 they don't require bond council um, opinion, which costs over $3,000. So <coughs> it saves money to go with this bank than to go with two of the other ones that were quoted. Great, thank you. thank you. Is that good? Yeah. Um, I have a, a question, Nola, because I've been stuck on this before, but I noticed that on the back of the lease um, memorandum, there is a motion. How imperative is it that we follow the wording of this exact motion? Um, it's, it's, um, it's fine if you just follow what was printed in the agenda. Great. Okay. okay. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Now we will really move to item 6B. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the 2017-2018 um, Administrative and Athletic Extracurricular Personnel nominations as listed in today's packet. A second. Discussion? I can do that. Yeah. Joe, so, sure. Names for middle driver. school, um, Suzanne Martin Nihilsberry for field hockey. For Pond Cove, Deb Sampson for organizational team leader, grade one. Cameron Rosenblum, instructor, team leader, allied arts in Pond Cove. And in Becky Bean, chorus, grade four. And district wide, Wynn Phillips at large, certification committee. I'd like to thank everybody for stepping up and being willing to do this extra work. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6C, may I have a motion please? I move that, wow, we're going to do a series. Uh, I move that we approve the following policies as presented. IGA, Curriculum Development and Adoption. IKE, Student Progress Through the Grades, Promotion, Retention and Acceleration of Students. IKF, graduation requirements, JJJ, high school co-curricular and extracurricular activities, eligibility, and code of conduct, and JL, student wellness. I second. Discussion. Worth taking them one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to be assisted by the Stanker or anyone up here who's been participating in some of this policy development, if you'd like to add anything. I'll be as brief as possible. I think we'll spend a little more time on eligibility. Curriculum development, IGA, is, uh, was, was reviewed just because it was a timely piece to review. And I think the standout piece there is the superintendent and director of teaching learning will take the lead in setting district goals and that there will be constant ongoing review, evaluation, revision, sensitive to changing conditions that require modifications. The, the, the world of what we need to do keeps moving a little bit, and this is our best take on approaching curriculum development in the current environment. Also ask for annual reports, or as otherwise requested to the board on the status of the curriculum. And it's asking that the board will review and approve all substantive curriculum changes prior to implementation. So there's a little room for discretion there with the superintendent and the director of teaching and learning, and I'm sure they'll bring us anything we need to be aware of based on this policy. Mm -hmm. IKE, promotion, retention, and acceleration of students, uh, pretty much kept that policy intact with the exception that we had quite a chat about decisions regarding grade level retention. That's a really big conversation to have when it comes to individual kids and we, uh, rather than putting the uh, sole decision making in the hands of the principal, really felt that this needed to be a full consensus that included the parents for it to be something to be successful for children. So we're emphasizing that this team shall be responsible for reaching consensus regarding retention versus the principal overruling the parents who then would have an appeal protocol. It's better that the team be on the same page going forward. So that was the main change to that one. Graduation requirements, IKF. You two may rest comfortably that it doesn't impact either of you. But this does start to phase in the proficiency diploma for the class of 2021 and beyond. As Mr. Shedd mentioned, current freshmen will need to demonstrate proficiency in meeting state standards in the four content areas of English, language, arts, math, science, and social studies. The following year, one additional content area of the student's choice and the following year, two additional content areas of the student's choice. That's how the state has required through statute that this be phased in over the next three years. Um, stand by whenever exactly sure where things may, may change, but this is our very best take on 
current legislation and the policy we should have in place recognizing it. For sophomores, juniors, and seniors, it remains a credit-based diploma with no changes to those requirements. Quick, yes. Okay. <coughs> Most of this follows what is the main policy. Are there any significant sort of optional or deviations from the main policy? It's pretty, it looks to me from what I recall pretty close to follow. Exactly. It's pretty. It's pretty close. The um, the state. The, we have asked for uh, experiences in English, language, arts, math, science, social studies each year of high school. That's an additional. Engage in learning experiences in world languages in at least two years is special to Cape and other districts. Uh, computer industrial performing and visual arts in at least two years. Uh, learning experiences in health and PE in at least two years. And learning experiences that integrate career and education development to other content areas is special to hear. As is uh, a really nice piece on uh, various pathways that students yeah. may yeah. use to attain their credits. Okay. Thank you for that. So we have additional, a little bit of additional specificity mm -hmm. and some description of pathways. Right. But none of that was changed. Yep. Okay. All right. In JJJ, high school co-curricular and extracurricular, we've had a couple of meetings with Mr. Shedd about this. I. Um, will allow him to answer any more questions you may have. I would say that any time change like this happens, it's going to feel a little messy at first. And it's sometimes hard to get the message clear to all 600 kids that are you know, listening with bated breath and parents trying to understand this. Uh, when the policy committee met with him, unlike other districts that, as he mentioned, jumped in whole hog, we felt that starting with the habits of work that were very specific and objective about timeliness and about showing up when you're asked to show up uh, were areas that, that would be way less subjective than some of the other habits of work around citizenship and so forth. So it seemed, uh, given the teacher group he worked with this summer, that it was a good starting place. We also were very supportive of the fact that there would be checkpoint dates, that there would be warnings where kids would have plenty of opportunity to address any issues. Again, this is looking for a score of 70, not perfect, not perfect, but a score of 70, just like in an academic grade, and that there would be the opportunity to remediate an issue. Um, we talked about the fact that we liked that if there was an issue, that the ineligibility would be much shorter than what's currently in the policy, which is um, all the way to the next checkpoint, which can be a full six to eight weeks. This would be just simply two weeks of a chance to make things up uh, in terms of getting back in to that 70 average. I do think it will take some more communication, as Mr. Shedd said. I find teachers at Cape Elizabeth High School aren't onerous markers in terms of wanting kids to be prohibited from extracurriculars and co. I think the opposite is true. I think there will be um, a generous, that would be my take on it, a generous interpretation of this as it gets started while kids get used to the expectation. But it did seem to us to be a very objective measurement to start to have timeliness and um, and just the personal responsibility of showing up. Certainly mistakes happen. That would, that would be no change from before. Um, in terms of worry for the kids that aren't involved in co-curriculars, I, I get that, but that's true with eligibility around academic grades as well. That's, that's a parallel concern, mm -hmm. I would think, in terms of motivation. Um, but certainly, your questions uh, can be honored. Uh, I would say, Mr. Shedd, as I was looking at this real quickly, we, we struck, if you look at the transition in eligibility period during school year 17-18, the language says, given that this is a new approach to eligibility, the length of ineligibility during the school year 2017-18 will be two weeks, commencing from the date of the email or the date of the first preseason practice if the student is an athlete and the email arrives before commencement of the season, whichever is later. We struck. Beginning with school year 18, 19, the period will be from the date of the email till the date of the next checkpoint. We really liked the two weeks of turnaround time versus a long period of ineligibility, um, which sort of makes D 
moot. So um, as we get to vote on this, or if you'd like us to visit it again, I'm thinking D, uh, we should just strike because now we're talking about the transition, the ineligibility period during school year 17, 18, and forward is what we uh, what we supported. Not going back to the longer length. That's not our point to keep kids out of or extracurriculars, it's rather to support, strongly support habits of work that uh, allow for their successful participation in school, their academic grades, and then on into co and extracurriculars. So we could take a look at that perhaps. And then uh, finally, uh, policy JL, wellness. Um, there were just a few highlights in here. This was uh, reflected a lot of work by the Wellness Committee last year. Heather Altenberg sat on that with a lot of teachers and Howard and nurses and so forth. There's a section on nutrition uh, that really talks about a minimum of 20 minutes for lunch. I like seeing the fact that, we, that we'll perhaps have a nutrition uh, director that would really be focusing on the um, nutrition education and the goals of, ha of meeting or surpassing federal nutrition standards. There's a section on social emotional well-being. Physical activity got a lot of conversation where there was an effort to have physical activity incorporated for every student every day. Uh, we got instead language that said teachers are strongly encouraged to incorporate physical activity in their classrooms or advisory periods or outdoors by integrating it into the curriculum and or using daily or weekly motor, motor breaks. Many on the committee felt very strongly that, that kids need a little more opportunity for movement. And however that can best work, depending on the age level, we should do. So um, would you add anything to that, Heather, from um, your recollection of the conversation? Yeah, it was a lot of meetings and a lot of really fruitful conversation on a pretty much weekly basis with um, nurses, social workers in the school, and um, there was a big, con uh, not concern, but emphasis on students needing to move, uh, whether it be in a formalized recess class or a gym class, but maybe perhaps it comes through advisory or uh, just teaching the, or um, encouraging the teachers to utilize their time to let the kids get the wiggles out or let the kids um, be able to use their bodies and move even if it's not just wiggles but actual movement uh, and we realize that in the high school there is naturally that built in as they go from class to class and uh, walk the hallways there um, we also talked a lot about uh, nutrition we spent a lot of time talking about nutrition and how there is quite a culture here in this school that um, is very established. But we, uh, as a committee, would like to encourage um, not using uh, sweets or food or candy as rewards. Uh, and there was a lot of very interesting conversation about that, but sort of emphasizing the need for the whole self to be healthy and well. It needs to be putting uh, good food in the body. Um, likewise, to go back to the piece about physical activity, we would like to discourage the idea of using taking away recess as a way of punishment. That that's just not an option. That uh, that, that that is a time that students need for their overall well-being. Uh, and then the other piece that we spent, I would say, a very fair amount of time talking about uh, is the emotional piece to the students. And there was a lot of discussion about stress in the high school, um, being a high-performing district and uh, students who care, uh, families who care tremendously. Um, there sounds like there's quite a bit of stress and how do you how do you manage that and how can we support that and help that and so we had um, we had a lot of conversation working around the idea that wellness is not just what you eat or what you do with your body but how you treat yourself emotionally and that there is quite a bit of support here in the school for that um, Talks about annual training provided to teachers and staff to recognize social-emotional needs of students as it pertains to their respective roles. That's mandated yep. in this policy. 
yeah. along with a whole list of goals around structured opportunities for social emotional integration, info about mental health resources, yeah. etc. So it goes into quite a few specifics. Yeah. I, and then I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just, that, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and then this idea of a steering committee, which is the wellness committee, following up to help monitor what's happening, not just creating this policy and then letting it just exist, but really, um, I think there's a lot of passion in the group to uh, really make some shifts towards a more healthy culture. Not that it's not healthy, but there's always room for improvement. So, Susanna. I'm curious, um, you mentioned the, in the high school level of the kids, you know, walking from one class to the other. I'm curious how much more additional attention was given to the, on the high school level for nutrition and activity. I would imagine, my guess is that Pond Cove and middle school got a lot of attention, but I, I don't want the high school to be yep. looked over. Deb Braxton, mm -hmm. who is the nurse in the high school, was part of the committee, and she uh, sees a lot of the kids eating the meals. Um, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, Howard was there for these conversations too, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but she felt like the high school cafeteria had healthy options and that oftentimes the salads are being eaten and the healthy foods are being eaten. Um, she did say there's a lot of bake sales. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a form of, you know, raising money for this community and that's just part of the culture. So we're not saying we're going to put the cash on everything. We're just saying let's be a little bit more mindful and aware and make some choices with, with a little bit more awareness around it. Um, as far as the physical activity, I, I think that there's a lot of very uh, active extracurricular, like mountain biking. I mean, isn't there, aren't there plenty of options, Jeff? There's, there's plenty of options, absolutely. The huge percentage of is obviously participating in sports and other non-athletic activities. Um, and there's plenty of options for those kids to participate. Yeah. But that doesn't mean to say that Right. But they have to take, it's not, a, what is the uh, requirement for uh, physical education in the high school? Is it how many? Semester. Just two semesters. Right. So that's the only formal, I guess, form of exercise. But I think that, I mean, I think that even if you get, um, even if you get students, this is just me talking right now, students who are in uh, theater and they're not athletic and that's their form, you're still moving quite a bit and you're still being very active, you know, bending down, picking things up, moving stage equipment around. So uh, I would imagine that just by the nature of being more independent and more grown up and at a different level, that it, that it comes at a degree of natural level, is, is my yeah. opinion. But that's a good question. I we do have sellers. One I, one I worry about, you know, is choices at the, in the cafeteria and, um, you know, just, you know, the, I think the more, uh, the more the wellness committee focuses on wellness and, and you know, just general knowledge for all, whether you're an extracurricular or not, the better. So mm -hmm. that, you, you know, you don't feel like, well, if you're not an athlete or you're not an extracurricular, then you know, might as well give up kind of thing on, on how Oh, I don't think that's the intention. No, I know it's not. Yeah. I, I know it's not. I'm just saying that the more awareness yes. that we keep pushing, the better. Yes. And, and it's going to, like anything with change, it's going to take time. Because... Yeah. And, yeah. and there was just one other thing I wanted to mention because it's one of my gripes year after year for the, and it's more for Jason's sake, I think, the Harvest Festival is just a candy plethora fest. of cake and candy. And one year, each of my three kids won <laughs> a cake at the cake walk. Like, so we came home with three whole cakes. So like, that's another area where we have to, I feel like we need to monitor, because it drives me bananas. They, they, the reason they want to go to the Harvest Fest, mostly, at least now my youngest daughter, is for the, the candy and the cakes and cupcakes. And yeah. so. it should be bananas. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, I think our student reps might want to in. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple things to the social and emotional well-being thing. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we 
kind of have a couple like campaign type things um, in the works um, to address that. First of all, I'd just like to say that the social workers and the guidance counselors are all really um, great people at the school and I think they're definitely a really strong resource um, if people are struggling or just people need um, help when it comes to course load or things like that. Um, and then Natural Helpers is also another program um, that we have at our school. Um, yeah, Emily. Emily is a natural helper, um, and she can sort of explain that. So the natural helper program is a, um, so basically students are chosen by their peers as someone that they see in their grade or in their school um, that they feel comfortable reaching out to if they're, if they're struggling with stress or if they're struggling with things that are a little more intense, red, red flag issues such as um, suicidal thoughts, eating disorders. Um, abuse, trouble at home, stuff like that, and we attend um, biannual trainings, one in the fall and one in the spring, to help us um, be better prepared and know, actually have the skills to listen to someone who is really struggling, um, and that's a great resource that I don't think I think could be taken advantage of more in the high school. Mm -hmm. um, students are, I mean, at least that I know of really struggle in the high school. It's a really, really difficult time for students and it's really stressful and I think there's a lot more issues um, that aren't being talked about as much, like red flag issues, like suicide and eating disorders, um, abuse, emotional, whether it's emotional, mental, physical, um, from a partner or from, but that could be talked about more than it is being talked about. Yeah. I agree. And then, then the last thing um, is a campaign called the Yellow Tulip Project. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it, um, but it's a really cool program that a girl from that goes to Casco Bay, Julia Hansen, started. Um, and so we're going to be bringing that to Cape Cod. Uh, and then hopefully a, a day in October we will actually be planting um, the Yellow Tulips. Um, and so hopefully Can you tell that, us what the Yellow Tulip Project is for? Yeah, so it's suicide and mental health, um, like, awareness, so, awareness yeah, sorry, um, and it was this girl, Julia Hansen, she actually lost two of her closest friends to suicide, um, and one's favorite color was yellow, and one's favorite um, flower was the tulip, so she put them together, and they're just basically um, planting them, like, in the spring they blossom, and it's really... Um, just to symbolize like like coming getting through the winter coming through the storm and like hope um, and that whole idea I think we've realized that that's really important um, and so we're hoping to get that sort of mentality um, into our school mm -hmm. Good. Great, thank you Two comments before the first on the wellness policy, and then I'd like to return back to the eligibility more briefly. Um, so first of the wellness policy, I want to congratulate the committee for, for the job that they did, and I want to particularly highlight what I think is a really, really important part of what the policy is, which is the <coughs> implementation of the monitoring piece. Because what that provides is a really flexible platform to really make these things in this policy actionable, because Again, more and more in my life as I find out, you get more of what you measure. And right now, we're not measuring. And this is a platform for that committee to look at and see what's important, whether it's those things in the high school or other, and for people to come to that committee and talk about these are the things that we think are important and how we're measuring them and how we're doing. So I really appreciate the thoroughness and the uh, ability to point the way forward for this particular policy. So thank you for your work on that. Anything else on wellness before we turn to I just had a quick question around the annual training provided to teachers and staff to recognize the social and emotional needs of students. Um, who, who does that? What is the training? Who does that training? Like, how, how is that going to work? How do we make sure that that happens? I, I, I'm, um, I guess I don't know the answer to that. I'm thinking it would probably be that we would go tap into the knowledge and expertise of our social workers and counselors. I guess social workers are, are um, this is what they do. And they got, we have some very talented people here that I think um, already offer individually uh, direction and support for to, to students and to, to teachers, but, um, but not as a group. 
So this would be something that our principals would be arranging as part of a faculty meeting that we would annually be sure that um, this is, is covered. And I'm sure there are people that are in the community, I know there are, that, that they do this for a living outside of schools and they could be brought in as consultants or as, as volunteers that people who live, they live here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I mean, there's plenty of people in this area that this is what, this is what they do and they do it well. Does that, does that seem right? Okay. Can I just ask what the backpack program is? It's listed under Cape Elizabeth Schools Will. Um, you have like a section that says school staff will identify students who are at risk of food insecurities and link them to available resources. Um, I'm sorry, I'll show you. It's right here. Under. Can you show me the, the, the page. The backpack program. Oh. That's the that yeah. I, I don't even know what that is. Just never heard of it. Is any of the principals willing to speak to that? My understanding was that was an issue of being able to bring um, food home on the weekend. Mm -hmm. If there's insecurity issues in the family, I'm seeing nods. Oh, it's okay. a it's a program that I've seen in other school districts right. where there's a large portion of the student population with food insecurity, and it's a respectful way to send that food home and back. Oh, okay. I so there's no longer access to free reduced lunch. This would get the child and some okay. family members through the weekend. Carry on. Thank you. Right. And we're actually talking about that right now. Mm -hmm. Can I just, on, um, on page one, under where it says uh, Cape Elizabeth Schools will, and I, I think it's, it's scheduled snack time at least one hour before the lunch meal, and I think it's I would presume um, making sure that the kids are going to be hungry by the time they go to lunch. I'm wondering also, I, I believe in the middle school, 7th and 8th graders, you could tell me if I'm wrong, are having lunch at 1030 and 1045, 1045, brunch. Um, but I wonder if we might want to put in um, afternoon snack. Uh, or, yeah. you know, snack. My um, daughter had talked about the possibility of an afternoon snack. Yeah, or at least one hour after. Meal is, you know, as, as well. So, well, I was yeah, on page. It's a long afternoon meal. This yeah. would be so on page, page one. Um, yeah, page, page one, one of the wellness student jail. wellness. So I don't know. Okay, if we so could you could just say before slash after. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we could. I think that was that. Slash after. After. Do we want to specify if it's really lunch? I don't know why. If, if, if we know. say before slash after, that's good. It leaves discretion. Yeah, I, I need to put a put a time piece on it. Right. I feel yeah. like snacks will be appropriately scheduled around the lunch period. Right. Yeah, and at, just at a minimum yeah. of yeah. one hour after, before or after. Okay. I actually think that middle school is allowing students to have snacks at the afternoon. All They're middle school. <laughs> they want to. Yeah, what can I say? <laughs> they grow an inch a day. Don't right. get in your way. Right. Keep going. Keep going. So yeah, anyway, I, I think about one amendment. So when we get to the motion on this, there would be a motion with the amendment on okay. policy JL um, okay. having so, to do with the, the snack time. Okay, got it. So I have, I have. Um, a quick comment on JL and then another question around JJJ, if that's okay. Um, on JL, I just want to first um, circle back to Emily and um, thank you. I'm sorry, I knew that. Um, thank you for bringing the Tulip Project to the school. It's, I think, an incredible, uplifting, reinforcing, positive thing to bring to the school and, and where it's based on and where it came from is just incredibly special. And then I also just wanted to thank Emily and, and all of your peers who are peer support groups. It's not easy work. So thank you for doing that really um, big heavy lift for our school. Um, coming back to JJJ, I'm wondering. Can I just say, are we good with, with nutrition? Should we move on to with that one amendment? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, no. Um, so with JJJ, I'm wondering um, if the process may be benefited if we table that particular policy for this evening and give the opportunity to maybe have our school, school board representatives bring it back to the school um, committee, um, to your student government council, and, and maybe have a chance to weigh in 
and also in that process do some co-educating with your fellow students around what all of those changes are based on in policy, if that would be beneficial. Um, one thing that I would like to say is I think that the two-week um, part of this is really important and I don't think that students are really aware of that part. Um, so I agree, I think that bringing that back to the students would definitely clear up some worries, um, especially for athletes and their coaches. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with that and I think that's a really good way to do it because it's sort of, it, it, it's a punishment in a way, but it also just is like reinf reinforcement in a way um, to stay on task, but it doesn't have a, a true punishment. It's a natural and, consequence. Yeah. And I think that, something that's also confusing to students is now that we don't have quarters, because um, it used to be eligibility by quarter, and now we, There's, we have period, I don't know. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be dates in your hand mm -hmm. book that talk about yeah. checkpoints. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So, we, and we have that, so I think that's also another thing to discuss with peers is some of them are not are unsure about how, we've kind of talked about it, but how that affects eligibility and now that we don't have quarters when those period, those checkpoints are and throughout the year, how that works. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shedd, do you feel the need to table this motion tonight that it would somehow help in the education or What's your best advice? Yeah, well, what's your best thinking my, around that? Since my that suggestion is also not just not just to educate the students, which I think is important, but also solicit their feedback on a, on a policy that they clearly have a lot of passion about. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we can we can work with that. Um, I think um, there definitely are some misconceptions out there. There's no question about it. So I have no problem um, doing some clarifying and that sort of thing. Um, it would mean, and this is fine, it would mean that probably we would apply just the existing eligibility policy um, and look at the grades. Now we'll have to figure out is, but it's all, solv it's all solvable, solvable stuff. So we would be applying the existing eligibility policy until such time as the board, as the, as the board formally adopts a new, a new version of the policy. It's all doable. Um, and I don't have a problem with it. You, you would feel comfortable bringing that back to the faculty as well, who's been sort of out front for this for you in the last week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be. Clarifying for them as well? Mm -hmm. Not be an issue. I don't think there's as many c confusions in, among this faculty about the eligibility policy particularly. Mm -hmm. um, I think the questions about or among the faculty are more about just some other mechanical things connected to other aspects of to some extent about habits of work, but I don't think it has specifically to do with eligibility. But I'd be certainly happy to entertain questions, conversations with, um, with staff as well and, and with students. Jeff, for expediency's sake, would it matter to you if we added this as a special, we tack it on to the end of our workshop? In two weeks. In two, In two weeks. weeks. We, I just want to make sure that we act on this in a timely manner for you. You brought this to us pretty early, and so I don't, you know, I don't want the board to. So I, I guess I, I definitely appreciate the question and where it's coming from, but I mean, I think to wait until the next business meeting and the normal course of okay. normal course of business, I think that's fine. That's okay. I mean, we can definitely work with that. And does that timetable also give the school board reps time to bring them back to your? Um, Student yeah. Council? Definitely. So with our Student Council, we just discuss the eligibility policy and then bring that information back to the school board. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Yeah. Or to the policy committee, and I think would probably be the most appropriate. We have a meeting scheduled for next Wednesday, so we can definitely put that at the top of the agenda. No, probably get together with Emily and Allie and okay. share some ideas, do some brainstorming as well. Great. Okay? Good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. John. So before we sort of finish the delay, I had a question clarification. Moving through the policy, can you sort of, is there a point in here or is in another policy that talks about um, sort of enforcement or exceptions to this policy, for example, in the case where it may be clearly in the best interest of the student to continue in an extracurricular activity, even if they may not meet the eligibility criteria? Is there any uh, possibility for that occurring? Or current policy. That came up actually at our last meeting. Mm -hmm. 
and Mr. Shedd assured us that life is full of exceptions from time to time, that teachers don't want this to feel malleable, but you, always, you never say never in any personal situation, whether there's an illness involved, whether there's a family tragedy involved. They're, they're, the point isn't to be, correct me if I'm wrong, but to, but to really err on the side of the student, not on the side of the policy. Teachers are really, really good about that. Yeah. Right. As we consider the policy, I wanted to make sure, because I didn't see it in here, that our policy does allow for that, because um, it's, it's, it wasn't clear in what I saw. So that's that. Its implementation of it as it stands gives me some comfort. But if should this come back around, I think we may want to make at least um, whatever exception process there is, at least somewhat explicit as to how it occurs. It's a, it's a slippery slope. Yeah, I, yeah. Of course, it always yeah. is. Yeah. But if we have a policy that doesn't actually put the student first, and in the circumstances I'm thinking of, that this would not. Um, I think we need to have that, consider having that in our policy, and the fact that we're sort of bringing it back around again gives an opportunity for that. And I speak to that, me, myself, and others that I knew when I went through school. My extracurricular activity and others I knew were their link to that school. Exactly. And had that gone away, you would have lost it. Please, please. Uh, and so th this doesn't seem to accommodate that as it stands. So. Please note, yep. and I should have said, that the first paragraph was also scrambled. Yep. To have the opening statement be, this policy is intended to support the physical, social, emotional well-being of students and to promote healthy, enriching, and safe co-curricular and extracurricular opportunities. We, we intentionally removed that statement first. To, yep. to make your point clear. But, Great. But so as long as we're clear who's the actual decision-making body who can then apply that general principle, I think we're good. So, and then the other comment I just wanted to sort of make is this sort of the student letter came to us, and as you're going back to your student body, is really around the habits of, of work thing. And it was sort of around the question that I asked before. The academic eligibility is nothing new. And everyone seems comfortable with that. And I would say to myself, and, the habits of work are actually more important. They're on par, but they're more important. If I get a high school student out of high school and they've got great work habits, that's the kid I want. If they've got straight A's, I may or may not, I don't know. Maybe they've got good work habits, maybe they, but, but those things are, are actually really, really important and belong on par or to have a good explanation of, of why they wouldn't be on par and I haven't seen one yet. So those things are really, really important and belong on par with this eligibility. So at least from my point, sitting here on the board, I wanted to make that piece clear. It's new, we're measuring it, we're still working out how we do that, but to me its importance is not, and its um, impact should not be up for debate. How we implement it, those things, I, I think there's room to, to make clear and accommodate, but the, the fact of it, I think, is, is not. I definitely agree with that, and I think that's really important to emphasize to the students right now, because I think the, the idea of habits of work is totally being just like looked past, and the only thing that is being focused on is the eligibility piece, just by the students. Like, the teachers have definitely addressed the habits of work, um, and I think that they're so worried about eligibility, they, they look past the importance of habits of work, and like we said earlier, um, that students that don't have clubs or sports to be eligible for say that it doesn't matter um, or doesn't matter to them as much. Um, and so I think we should definitely work on stressing that, that this is something that is ultimately going to help in the future um, and going forward. And I, one of you said, it, you, you feel some kids have said, well, it will help me keep on track. It'll help me keep focused about mm -hmm. timeliness and responsibility and so forth. So that's a good mantra to mm -hmm. keep in mind. So, I, oh, go ahead. I just think that also, just from um, going through the cable of the school system, that our teachers and um, faculty naturally impose, like, require students to have exceptional habits of work, and of course there are always exceptions to that, but the majority of the student body has, have, has really great work habits. Um, great. So, we, I hope we will be able to move on, but I would briefly like to just bring up the point that the, the policy that we're speaking about is specifically about co-curricular and extracurricular activities, 
it is not about habits of work. And so to help reframe um, co-curriculars and athletics and those sort of things are privilege. And so applying these standards uh, with the habits of work and um, grade eligibility, it's, it, it, I don't feel like it's appropriate to talk about students who don't do those things because this policy is for students who do those things. It's not about students who don't choose to do those things. And so that's what this policy is about. It's not about how students who don't choose to do those things are held accountable for their habits of work. That's not even germane to the conversation. It's not about accountability for all students. It's about the privilege of participating in activities and sports. So I appreciate all the work going into this and I'm really excited that you're willing to bring it back and talk to people about it. to clarify so many important things. Educate. Thank you. Thank you. Howard. Uh, can we shift to policy IKE? Mm -hmm. That's the one about promotion, retention, and acceleration. It's really it's a question for, um, for Jason. Um, it's benefit. Uh, and retention, B, retention. This is really all that happens in elementary schools. Mm -hmm. I, um, at least I hope so. Um, it, it, it assumes that there will be a consensus. And at times that you do not reach consensus. So I want to be sure that we agree that if we don't reach consensus, that a student is promoted. Correct. Correct? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Our, our, our conversation was that without the parents feeling very in support of that move, it, it is good. So it would only be a full team decision for the child to feel supported emotionally at home and the school to feel that it's a, right. a, a wise thing for that child. Otherwise, it's not beneficial. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I think um, that we are ready to move the question with one amendment. Do you need a friendly amendment? You said we need an amendment on the one that Howard noted and a tabling of JJJ. So you're, you're putting a hold on JJJ, correct? Yes. So and I believe. Do we, do we need a motion? So the, the friendly and amendment to your motion. And you amended wellness. I think someone should suggest an amendment to me that I would accept as a friendly right. amendment. Jill, would you like to do that? So yes. So my suggestion for a friendly amendment to your motion, Barbara, would be to um, approve the policies as represented in our packet: IGA, IKE, IKF, and JJJ, and to table JJJ. And you mean JJL? Sorry, I want my glasses on. JL. I didn't hold it far enough away. And you want to amend JL, right? Yes. Include JL in the in the approval, but table JJJ. Do you want me to say that again for clarity? <laughs> and you were going to amend JL around snack time. So, so much. They have a one hour. Oh, and then to amend the policy of JL to add the before or after lunch time around. Right. For snack time. Mm -hmm. That's what you're trying to tell me. Okay. So I would say I accept your friendly amendment. We will vote on IGA, curriculum development adoption as explained, IKE, student progress through the grades as explained, IKF graduation requirements as explained, JJJ, high school co-curricular and extracurricular eligibility tabled until our October business meeting, and JL student wellness with a slight language change around availability of SNAP. Mm -hmm. Second. Discussion. We've discussed the heck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> because we just had an amendment, I have to follow protocol. John. Does that make this the amended one a first read now or not? Not, not material. No, because it's, it's not, not a material, material change. change. Yeah. It's a That's what I want to tiny. Yeah. Um, Suzanne, did you have? No. Nope. Okay. All those in favor? Thank you. Moving on to item 6D, may I have a motion please? I move we approve the job description for the Assistant Director of Nutrition. A second. Discussion? I believe this is a position. Okay, that so this is a position that was uh, drafted um, by uh, Peter Esposito and it's been uh, discussed with staff and there's, as I said earlier, there's agreement to this um, and 
with the expectation that a part-time person would be hired for the high school. So this is ready to go if you support it. And that he would offer somebody internally the opportunity to, for that, um, with, with, um, that, that promotion. So I'm sorry for clarification. I do have a question on that. You mentioned that this would be for a part-time position for the high school? Well, if this is approved and somebody um, currently employed, which is likely, moves into this job, in order to have sufficient staffing at both schools during the lunch hour, it will require Peter to hire a part-time person for the high school, and he's prepared to do that. It's still a, a, a savings to the budget. Okay, but the assistant director of nutrition position would be a full-time position. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, thank you yeah. for the clarification. Mm -hmm. okay. Further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Item 6E. I move that we appoint school board members, one delegate and one alternate to the Maine School Board Association's Annual Assembly, taking place on Thursday, October 26, 2017. I second it, but do we not have to have names at this point, or no? Yes, we do. So. I'm trying to think back to caucus. Mm -hmm. When was that, um, was it Kimberly and Barb, what did you talk, was this when we were talking about? Caucus is usually when we pick it. Pick, so yeah, it seems so long ago. <laughs> no. I feel like this was, it was someone in Barbara, an someone alternate. Was I the alternate? You were the alternate. John, did you? I don't think I was the person. I might have been the alternate, but I wasn't. <laughs> I know it wasn't me. I know. <laughs> I had served as a delegate before, and then the following year I think I did. I've served so as a delegate. Was, I think, Kim, were you yeah, willing to do it to this year? Do it. It's a great experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was about to look up our <laughs> Would you like me to committees in case we need a motion? <laughs> Would you like me to amend the motion? Should put a name in? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I move that we appoint Kimberly Carr, school board member, as the delegate, and Barbara Powers as the alternate to the Maine School Board Association's annual assembly taking place on Thursday, October 26, 2017. I would respectfully, respectfully uh, push the alternate assignment to John Bolts, who is also interested. Excellent. Having done it before, I just assume that John be your backup. So you can both go, right? I I'll accept your friendly anyway. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you can, they can both go. It's just one, de one, de one is the voting delegate. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, you can sit in and listen if you're able to be there. Thank you both for doing this. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. And we will probably meet ahead of time for discussion about They usually send out a, a, a slate right. of issues mm -hmm. for you to review and go over because you are voting on our behalf at the, at the assembly. And, um, Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6F. This is a motion that um, in support of a resolution drafted by the American Association of School Administrators. They're asking each school board to consider adopting uh, their draft or something like that, basically being clear that um, they value it at, at public education. I mean, it's obviously a response to the political climate that we are, are in today and uh, they felt this would be uh, useful um, to have a number of districts on, on, on records uh, supporting something like this and um, I believe that um, those districts that approve something uh, in support of public education will be gathered and su submitted uh, for a, a national coalition. I move that we um, approve the AASA's resolution in support of public education. May I ask that we read the resolution? Sure. Okay. The resolution in support of public education. Um, 
AASA, the School Superintendents Association, advocates for the highest quality public education for all students and develops and supports school system leaders and AASA supports and values an inclusive, safe, and innovative quality public education system that ensures all students can succeed regardless of their zip code, the color of their skin, their native language, their gender or gender identity, their immigration status, their religion, or their social standing. And AASA promotes equity and excellence for students, educators, and administrators by implementing continuous improvement and research supported best practices. And AASA advocates for policies that address the unique needs of persistently underserved children. And AASA supports creating stable, equitable, predictable, and adequate funding for schools based on local, state, and federal revenues that will meet the challenges of universal proficiency and provide the funding base needed to support a system which leads to success for all students. AASA supports the application of public school accountability systems for all educational institutions receiving local, state, or federal funding, including, but not limited to, virtual schools, charter schools, independent schools, and homeschool placements. AASA supports public school choice in charter schools that operate under the government governance of local public school boards. There should be a level playing field, including non-discriminatory and unconditional enrollment for all children. Common regulations and accountability should apply to all schools receiving public funding. And keep going. All right, well, maybe three pages is quite a bit. That's quite a bit. Um, so, geez. this is publicly posted. It was posted <laughs> seven days before this meeting, and it will be available after right. in perpetuity. So, thank you, Susanna. If you want me to read it to you later, I can read you later. <laughs> I'll call you. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have a second yet. I'll second. Thank you. Discussion. There's a lot to this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the part about um, application of public school accountability for all education institutions receiving local, state, or federal mm -hmm. funding. That has not been the case, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it is felt very unfair um, in terms of the sort of public perception of what's happening in the various alternative paths versus just your local public school. I think it brings everything into an equity place. Mm -hmm. There is one aspect um, that, that gives me pause, and that would be the support of um, school choice and charter schools, in that in many districts across the country, and even our own, we have, um, there's financial implications for the public school system within the hometown, which charter school students have their EPS funding formulas, they follow them to those charter schools. And in some school districts across the country that's had detrimental effects. So it, it just opened for conversation and it's a point that gives me pause in supporting this resolution. Further discussion? Just understand that it's not a policy that we are adopting, but more a show of support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I, I would add, it gives me pause as well. However, I, I feel that most of the challenge lies in the implementation of how those concepts are adopted in terms of school choice and chart. Mm -hmm. And uh, that those details are not contained within this, so I'm more comfortable. I also, this is not a thing. Is, um, there's more power in a general agreement with the uh, association of superintendents. So, uh, on that basis, I would support. Further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Seven.
Item 7, Committee Reports. Pretty early on for us to have any reports since we just had a special business meeting. But, yeah. So, on the related, this was in our packet as well. You can see on the agenda, we just go the next to the answer our materials. Was there anything on our agenda related to that? That was not on the agenda, yeah. just included. Just the mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I just want to say about the town comprehensive plan. Um, the next meeting is on Monday, September 25th at 7 p.m. I believe I mentioned this before, but if you go on the town website, uh, there is a link uh, where first you have to sign up to become a member of this um, conversation. Um, and then once you're approved, which just means your email is verified, then you can go on to this public forum where there's a question posed usually every 10 days. And currently the question just, um, I don't have it right in front of me. The current question is how um, people feel about uh, creating new jobs and employment within our town. So it, it changes, and I think the more input that the community puts in, the better we will come up with a, a plan that's best for all. John? And there's a good article on the town website about the current level of participation and what's like the town plan. If you're interested, you can see the news release about that participation and invite and links to participate. Great. Thank you. Most of our committees will be getting rolling again as the school year is started. Um, we have a section for announcements of upcoming meetings. So I haven't had a chance to run this by Heather or Kim yet, but <laughs> we were we bounced around our meeting times in the spring because of so many conflicts, and we tried to have sort of a standing time that would give us two weeks before the regular board meeting. So I'd like, and I won't announce the date for sure tonight, but I want you to consider 5:30 prior to our workshop on September 26 that we get going back with policy. I see one nod. Do you need to check on that? I'll uh, check, yeah, okay. thank you. But that would be our goal, is to find an established time, hopefully preceding one of our already evenings out to get back to policy, and we have a few things still to talk about. Appreciate that. I need to move to item eight, school board agenda requests. So, I would say, if we need to have this as an agenda item, the, the two, uh, fully, uh, First of all, included in our materials was testimony from our special ed director about Regulation 134. I urge everyone to read it. It is excellent. I fully endorse it. If we need to endorse it as a board, I would request that be an agenda item to fully endorse it. To fully stop. Mm -hmm. We can consult with Howard whether or not that needs to be an agenda item for endorsement. Okay. Um, school board agenda requests can be made via email or phone call um, to the superintendent's office or to the school board chair myself. Um, we appreciate getting those agenda requests um, a minimum of uh, a week before the business meeting. Moving on to item now, uh, item nine, announcements of upcoming meetings. Policy committee is working that out. Um, Upcoming, you talked about town call, town September 25th, 7 p.m. Um, and Heather, do you feel that wellness will continue to meet? They, we were talking about it. Um, I think it will meet. It hasn't been settled yet. We haven't just gotten going yet. But I do think it will meet, as will buildings and grounds. But I'm not sure of that meeting date yet either. Just getting going. Again. Just getting going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, kind of a shot over the bow to people, although we have just begun the school year, we will be um, reconvening our calendar committee, committee at some point this fall, so that, have that on your mind as well. And um, we have an upcoming school board retreat. Um, we have had to change the date, so we will get that information out to people 
as soon as possible, and the location is as yet a mystery. You will know soon. Item 10, may I have a motion, please? I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Thank you.